Well, folks, it's my last Sunday with you. Oh. <laughs> I shall be with you in spirit, as they say. And yes, there is a watch on the end of it. No drum roll. <laughs> no drama. Quickly. I'll do that again. There's a watch on the end of this. <laughs> We're getting there, folks. <laughs> we end so slow as we were. <laughs> I am taking a risk this morning. I'm going to talk to you about a subject that we don't normally talk about so openly and blatantly as I intend to do today. And certainly on a Sunday morning of this nature, we might want to avoid it, but I'm going to talk to you about death. And the reason I'm going to talk to you about death he said, I don't believe in it. <laughs> death is an ugly word. It's in our vocabulary in English and it seems to me an ending, a shutting off, something beyond which there may be nothing but oblivion. That's not what awaits us. I'm convinced of that. The ancient Greeks, the wise old Greeks, and yes, they were most of them old white men with beards like me. The old ancient Greeks talked about metamorphosis. Two words meaning change of form. They didn't believe in death any more than our Hawaiian friends did. Look at our statement for today. The face is out of sight, hidden in the sky, said of one who is dead. They didn't believe in extinction any more than the ancient Greeks, any more than we should, any more than Jesus did. And let me remind you of what Jesus taught us in regard to that. He said in John, the 14th chapter, second verse, in God's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. In God's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. What is a mansion? A mansion, we have some notion of a Hollywood residence of immense proportions. Something to which the late Anna Nicole Smith might have resorted with her millions. That's actually not a, a mansion at all. And in order to explain to you what a mansion really is, let me take you on a little excursion, which will cost you nothing. Some of you may have gone to the north of England, in that part of the world where those beautiful moorlands rise up from the lowlands. And you may have seen Hadrian's Wall. How many of you have seen Hadrian's Wall? One, two, three. Not too many. Hadrian's Wall is a wall about seven or eight feet tall, built across northern England. It's about 70 miles in length. It was built by the emperor, by the order of the emperor, Hadrianus, we would have called him Adrian today. He was a Spaniard, a Spanish emperor. The Romans drew their emperors from all over their empire. Hadrian decreed that the wall be built to separate the Scots from Roman occupied territory to the south. The Scots have always, bless their dear beloved hearts, been totally unconquerable. God bless the Celtic fringe. When the Scots became part of Great Britain in the early 18th century, it was because they sold Scotland for 250,000 golden guineas. As a matter of fact, the Scottish, insofar as there was an aristocracy in Scotland, the Scottish aristocracy were broke. 
so they sold Scotland to the English. They've been trying to break free ever since. Maybe next month it'll work. I'm not going to go there. We don't talk politics on Sunday morning. But Hadrian, Hadrian ordered, decreed that this wall be built. And it runs for about 80 miles from sea to sea, divides Scotland from the south. And it still stands, and people walk across it. In ancient times, 2,000 years ago, can you, can you take your mind back 2,000 years, almost? Really, to the time of Jesus himself, this wall was built. And yet every few miles, as was the custom and the won't, that's a nice word, I like won't, as was the custom and the won't of the Roman military authorities, every four or five miles, a little house was built. You can go into these little places today on Hadrian's Wall. They contained grain and wine. Today they would have contained health food bars, I'm sure, and good, sound, healthy drinks. The Romans marched usually for four or five miles of our modern miles at a time, and then they rested. And they rested in these places that were called mansions. The word mansion in Latin and in the earlier Greek means a sort of a resting place, a place where one stops for a while. Not some great pretentious 17-room mansion with 25 bathrooms, just a little place to stop on the road as they marched. And the Romans marched a lot, back and forth, back and forth. That's how they kept their empire, their vast empire, intact. They kept their army on the move. Oh! Always marching, moving along, constantly moving. But there were always these little mansions, mansiones, where they could stop and have a little refreshment. Jesus offers us this beautiful insight into the nature of the universe. In the universe, in God's creation, there are many resting places. But life, abundant life, goes on and on and on and never ends. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about, about a very personal, indeed one or two very personal revelations. I wouldn't do this if I didn't feel comfortable with you. I trust you and I want to share with you some of the experiences that I've had that convince me that Life is all there is. I would if I could, and this will shock you. A minister dares to say this. I would say to you, I would rather remove the word God. It's so loaded with so many connotations. Not least the notion of old men with beards. And I would like to substitute for that contentious word, another, with an initial capital letter, life, life, that's what God is, life, life everywhere abundant, everywhere present, and we in it, there's no place where we can run from life, life, constant life, and that's what I want to just mentioned to you today as I leave you because the realization of everywhere present life has had such a profound effect on my thinking has changed me to such a degree that I feel at some point in our relationship I need to share my trivial insights with you please remember that I don't want to convert anybody. I am not interested in obliging you to believe what I say. You may say, oh, there are rational explanations for what he tells us. That may be true. I was turned into a rationalist by my experience in education, higher education. I was taught to disbelieve absolutely anything 
that couldn't be absolutely proven. That's the realm of reason. We move perhaps into the realm this morning of faith. So let me share a couple of stories with you. If we postulate a life beyond this one, there must be some intelligible dimension to it. And we also have to consider the possibility, which many people don't, of life before birth. Why is it when we talk about ongoing life, we always talk about life after death, which is up here? We are cursed in many ways by our Western linear thinking, which moves inexorably from A to Z. Many of the wise old Eastern philosophies and religions don't go there. They don't try to impose linearity and time on these experiences, and neither should we. But let's look back for a moment at the possibility of life before birth. And let me tell you a story. Now, as I say, you may choose to believe this story. You may see it as a delusional experience. It certainly has no political significance. It's just a story about something that happened to me and convinced me, as much of a rationalist and a skeptic as I am, that life is something enduring, something that we must recognize before this existence as well as after it. Not as a possibility, not as a probability, but as a certainty. I'll start by telling you the first story. My wife and I, when we decided to have our second child, were no young, longer in the first bloom of youth. I wouldn't say we were past our prime, that would be going too far, but we were no longer young. My wife, I believe, was 39 and I was of a similar age and we decided we would like a second child. And so my wife was pregnant and her doctor had told her that at her age there was the possibility that a child, an infant, might be impaired in some way. There was mention of Down syndrome. The obstetrician was a little bit nervous, cautious. My wife and I had already decided that we would have whatever child came to us and love it as a special being. But I knew, as one does know instinctively, when one is close to another individual as a partner, that she was concerned and she was worried about what might happen. And one night when she was about three months into the pregnancy, I had an experience, the kind of experience that I've had before, not a dream. I would call it perhaps a vision. The room, and I was wide awake, the room was filled with light, filled with the most beautiful light, the light that I saw when I was dead, when I had my near-death experience. That same beautiful light, the same magnificent feeling of, one would call it love, but the word is so mundane. It's so jejeune in our language. A feeling of total acceptance and joy, very life itself. And out of that vivid light came this beautiful child, maybe four or five or six years old, who can say, he came out of that light with his arms open, he was golden-haired and blue-eyed, golden as how und blaue Augen. He had golden hair and blue eyes, which 
does not run in either of our families, I can assure you. And he came towards me with such an expression of joy that I wanted to just sweep him up. And then he vanished. And so I woke my wife with the traditional elbow. We have that prerogative when we have partners. The wives usually do it to remind the men that they snore, which is totally untrue. It's an absolute lie. <laughs> men don't snore. I'm here to tell you. Men do not snore. Anyway, I woke her up and I said, don't worry, we're going to have a little boy and he's going to be blue-eyed and blonde-haired. And I forget what her response was, but it was probably, thank you very much, now could we get some sleep? I don't remember. But six months later, in the birthing room, she had natural childbirth, in the birthing room, that little boy came. And he's our, our beloved son, Andrew, who is now 37. Um, take that experience as you wish. Uh, to me, it is an evidence of some self-conscious activity uh, before movement into this particular expression of life. I can't explain what it's like to be a mother. I haven't the slightest idea. I can only imagine. I know what it's like to be a father, to be proud and to be thankful and to be joyous that one's beloved partner, perhaps, has come through what should never be an ordeal but a joy satisfactorily. Let me move to the other end of the spectrum and talk for a minute about life after so-called death. My mother died at the age of about 81. I think she was 81, 82, possibly. She died in my arms. She predicted her own passing a year before it occurred. She was gifted with what we sometimes call second sight. She had some remarkable experiences, indisputable proof in my estimation of conscious self-reflective life after death. I haven't the time to share them, any of them, with you this morning. But remember, I am a skeptic. I was trained to be a skeptic. Not all historians are as skeptical as they ought to be, or philosophers, but I was trained in a good school. Never accept anything without solid, verifiable proof. So I'm not easy to convince. So we're moving into realms here of speculation of what we sometimes call faith, but utterly convincing as far as I'm concerned. After my mother died, about three months after that event, I had yet another vision or revelation. The room again was filled with light and I saw a huge circular ball. What ball? Isn't circular. But it was covered in reflective facets that were almost painful to observe. Those of us who are old enough to remember the ballrooms where those globes used to go round and round, throwing various little bits of light on everyone. Does anyone remember those? I gave up ballroom dancing at a very early age when I dropped my dance instructress. Uh, she was trying to teach me the tango, and we did a dip, and I dropped her. <laughs> and subsequently I thought that was not likely to improve my romantic chances in life, so I, I am not a dancer. <clears throat> but you remember, some of you perhaps, or you've seen those, those globes. It came to me and, in fact, was told me that the individual that I had known as my mother, with all her characteristics, her very human characteristics, I was not to imagine for a moment that those characteristics represented who she really was. She was infinitely greater in extent. And that ball of reflecting light seemed to indicate analogously what she had become. If ever she needed to contact me or I, her, then somehow the original sentiments that we had experienced as mother and son would find expression. But I was in no way to believe or to accept 
that she was still anything as, I hesitate to say it, as banal as the human being that I had known in life. She was so many faceted that it was almost inconceivable to imagine. Those are two examples of life before birth and life after death. And the near-death experience or the death experience, I died on the operating table, the death experience that I encountered when I was a young man placed me in a realm so exquisite, so beautiful, that words cannot explain it. I often find with people who have had death or near-death experiences that not surprisingly, words fail them. They cannot, there are not words, in this language at least, to explain or to indicate what has incurred. The, the philosopher Wittgenstein <laughs> told us that <laughs> language, language defeats us when it comes to meaning. I can't tell you, I cannot tell you literally what I experienced. Light, light, color, acceptance, love, music, joy. You see, when we pass from this dimension into the next, perhaps when we come from another dimension into this, we step out of eternity into time. And time has its own constraints by which we measure our life's progress. But these are nothing. These are momentary. Whatever pain and suffering and sadness we may feel, however appalling that might be, or reprehensible it might be, and I don't mean to diminish the suffering and the pain that many of us feel and have felt, it doesn't signify in universal terms, because we are creatures born of eternity. Life is eternal. It's not going to be the kind of life that we've experienced here. Maybe for a while we might stay close to this experience and reflect upon it and contact those whom we've left behind. But that's not eternal life. The life that awaits us is beyond, is totally beyond description. It is a joy, it is a fulfillment, it is a coming into the one with the very spoken word, with the very creative energy that made us. And so I want to leave you, if anything, with this thought. And as I said before, I have no desire to convert anybody, to convince anybody. You may have rational explanations for the experiences that I've shared. That is fine. But I would pray as I leave you, never be afraid of life. Never be afraid of life. Life lifts us and takes us unto it and it's never taken from us. Life is not conditional. Life is ours through all eternity and we can confront that prospect surely with anticipation and joy. For surely that is God's plan. I am convinced of it for us. Thank you.